Until last night, we brought you the chilling details of the abduction and killing of a 14 year old by the name of Nancy Eagleson. It has been more than 60 years since her killing in the small village of Paulding. That's right along the Indiana line. There is so much to this story. Mistakes made by police, hundreds of suspects, rumors and conspiracy theories. But in 1960, the small town innocence of Paulding was lost as police hunted for the killer. And to this day, the killer has never been found. Lead investigator Brian Duggar picks up the story. Just outside the village of Paulding is a stretch of land known as Nancy's Woods. 2.30 in the morning of November 14, 1960, in those woods, raccoon hunters found the lifeless body of Nancy Eagleson. Hours earlier, the 14-year-old girl was abducted while walking home from the movies with her five-year-old sister, Cheryl. And I remember I was sitting in my dad's lap, and uh, they just, Mr. and Mrs. Eagleson, we're sorry to tell you, but we found your daughter, and she is dead. After we would all go to bed, I would hear my dad get up and go and check every door and make sure they were locked. So just all at once, you know, everything changed and everybody was scared. I'd tell a lot of folks that this is the most, most emotional case in our county's history. Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick. and It's a case that Nick Edwards has spent hundreds of hours investigating for his podcast, True Crime Garage, but also as a member of the Porch Light Project, a nonprofit victims advocacy group. It assists law enforcement on cold cases and helped with additional testing in this case. And you can make a strong argument that it was a local guy, it had to be a local guy, it had to be somebody that knew the area, knew, knew that town very well, knew the people. But then you could look at every aspect of that as well and, and argue that, no, for, for whatever reason, evil passed through here that day and took Nancy away. Whoever the killer is, he is evil. The autopsy shows that Nancy was raped and shot once under her chin with the bullet passing through her brain. A sketch was developed based on Cheryl's description, dark hair, glasses, maybe early 40s, and well-dressed. And this man was dressed, this boy, man, whatever, was dressed in a suit from church, like he just came from church. And he had a fedora on. Uh, whether that's how he always dressed or was it something he put on to look older. She says Nancy was thrown into the back seat and appeared to go limp just before 8 p.m. So I smelt something, and when I told them I smelt something funny, at first they thought it might have been like beer. Um, but then when I told them how he was messing in his pockets and doing something and I couldn't see what he was doing, and the way she looked when she left, left the drive there, uh, they thought maybe that he might have chloroformed her. A little more than six hours later, her body was found seven miles away. I've reviewed hundreds of homicide cases. Two things that stand out that are not typical are that one, that a victim is abducted and then found so quickly afterwards. I mean, she's found hours after she was abducted and killed. The other thing is the where they located her body is not terribly far away from where she was abducted. That immediately cast suspicion on Joseph Offrand and Kenny Nelson, who were spotted by a highway trooper coming out of the woods after finding Nancy. Offrands can be seen in a newspaper photo from the site where Nancy was found. There were a lot of people uh, walking about, milling about. There were even, 1960, there were even media people showing up uh, relatively quickly. So um, yeah, there, there was a lot of that and, and he, I didn't see much evidence that they, that they really blocked off the area and secured the scene very well. After the discovery, police received several tips. One involved the city of Antwerp. A man knocked on a resident's door at 1.30 in the morning, asking how to get to a city in Indiana. He was described as having dark hair and glasses, matching Cheryl's description and a composite sketch. Nancy was found on Route 176, which leads directly into Antwerp. 
Whoever the killer is, he left a young witness behind. I thought for sure that he was going to come back and get me. And uh, I thought, that, you know, I knew at five, I thought, you know, my mom and dad couldn't protect her. They're not going to be able to save me either. At one point, Cheryl believes the killer did return while she was staying at her grandmother's house. The back door come flying open. And I screamed so loud. And my mom come running up to get me. She thought that I cut myself or something. Saw the door open, immediately grabbed me off the chair and went to the other room to call uh, my dad and my grandfather. And then they got the police and they came over and they had found that a knife or a screwdriver, I'm not sure now it was a knife or screwdriver on the back porch. They had pried the two locks that were on the door. But the argument for an outsider materialized years later in Mark Hodges. In the mid-1960s, Hodges was accused of shooting a young girl and later killing a woman near Perrysburg. He was not convicted at either trial, however, but he did later spend years in prison for sexually oriented offenses. A law enforcement official told us he was in a nearby bar the night of the killing. An interview with Hodges convinced Sheriff Keeler that he was their man, according to two law enforcement sources we talked to. But none of the evidence could tie him to the scene. And that evidence has vanished. That will always forever be uh, one of the issues that he, even I, again, who wasn't alive in 1960, had nothing to do with this, will have a black eye because this evidence is missing. At one point, it was taken to the Toledo Crime Lab, but Toledo confirmed to us that it does not have it. No one knows where it is or how it disappeared. Obviously, something happened to it at, at some point, well before my career here. And, uh, you know, and again, in this case, it's unfortunate because there was great evidence, I believe, at that time that would have brought a resolution to this case, uh, again, probably before I started my career here. I found it. But weeks after talking to Sheriff Landers, a possible break in the case came during an 11 Investigates interview. Ta da! <laughs> uh, haven't had it out for a while. My goodness. Wow, what a way to end. A little <laughs> dramatic development there, Brian. So tell our viewers a little bit more about what we just were talking about. You saw there at the end who that man is exactly. Yeah, tomorrow night we're going to introduce you more to this, this man. His name is actually Don Roanhouse, and his name kept coming up over and over during the course of our investigation. So one day we decided to just stop on in unexpectedly and, and hear his story, and his story really was pretty shocking. And what I can tell you, because of that interview, that gun that you just saw is now in possession of investigators. And we'll break that down more tomorrow night. Wow.